from Campinas in, uh, in the state of Sao Paulo, in Brazil. And so now we are, we have the word, let's say, future. So we have a lexical item saying future uh, that is directly a temporal term. Uh, but when we look at what's in there um, as an ideogram or pictogram or graphic production or depending on how you want to use, you know, take it, you will see that you have a text that says there, for example, uh, is how to prepare the citizens or the students um, in high school for the challenges of the future in society. Here it says something like high school. And then we, you know, what is interesting, different from grammar and linguistic production, is that uh, you don't have a particular rule for how you're supposed to explore this figure. You may, you may go with your, you know, your eyes not working. Uh, you may go with your eyes over the text down there first, <coughs> or maybe one sec, uh, or maybe you focus your attention over here, or maybe over there. So there's no particular propositional, let's say, step-to-state procedure. What's the question for cognitive sciences? Would be okay. We have a term future. We have something preparing about the future. But why is this person projected frontwards? What is it about frontwards or front? that has anything to do with the future. Uh, and I did some experiment like in, long ago. I, I was manipulating this figure that I said, OK, this is educational system A. This is what happens. Educational system B was like this. And then so the guy was kind of falling over here. And then educational system C was like this. And then the question was, which one is the best educational system preparing for the future? And which one is the worst? And then. Uh, the answer is the best being A, and then the worst was C, right? So the transitive inferences, better than, better than, worse than, and so on. The question then is why? And people don't know why. People just say, well, I mean, it's obvious. This is better. The other one is not as only gets to here. That one goes further away. But there's no temporal reasoning explanation about time that is directly, uh, we're just users of these forms of mappings, but we not necessarily understand them in, in any conscious way. And of course, we can come up with stories and concoct some history, you know, some uh, confabulation. Yes? Somebody could you lower the light in front of the So here's another example now. We go beyond text and beyond just illustrations. Now is real action, motor action in real time. Okay, so here's an LA scene. We're here in LA. Maybe it's me. I'm a little dyslexic. I read this three times. Maybe it's me. It's the Wycliffe Country Place Skilled Nursing and Rehabilitation Home. Explain their slogan. Helping residents today remember tomorrow's yesterday. <laughs> <laughs> now, wouldn't that be today? <laughs> natural language in the sense that the guy is not talking to an interlocutor in a fully natural scene, but still informs and gives some interesting information just to illustrate the point. So here we have a text that has clearly some you know, temporal lexical items, like the word tomorrow or the word yesterday. They have other grammatical issues there. But for the point here is that when he is saying or referring to that, <coughs> Certain things are going to happen with his hands and mouth and face. So we said, wouldn't that be today? And so we said, here we go. That's the mouth shape for wouldn't that. Okay. And then we're going to go about 40 milliseconds, frame by frame or something. You can see now the finger, the index finger is starting to come out. He's about to say B. Wouldn't that, that's the B starting the B now. Wouldn't that be? By now, the hand shape is incredibly well formed with the index coming out. So the hand morphology is very well defined. And now the interesting thing is that with the accentuation of the syllable for today, um, he's also going to go today. That's the A of today, <laughs> eyes closed, etc. And now he stays there pointing. So this is an, what is called an abstract pointing. He's not pointing at a guacamole stain or mayonnaise or something. He's pointing at today. So 
and all orchestrated in a few hundred milliseconds, just uh, what is about to form, the hand is already coming out the finger and so on, what it says today. And then when he wants to contrast that with tomorrow, he said, tomorrow, go back, <coughs> go south, there's the tomorrow, pointing in front of him, and so on. And then it goes back to today, etc. So this is just to illustrate that if you ask this person what is he doing at this moment, he, he doesn't know, he doesn't have a clue at how he's coordinating all these various motor actions in real time, very specific, and the pointings are in this sense abstract, they have temporal reference, and they have a very specific orientation in space. So, um, when you do tons of analysis of these sorts, linguistic material, uh, illustrations and graphic productions, and, and, and analyze the um, um, gesture production, <coughs> post-speech gesture production, and so on, you get the summary, this is kind of the one-liner, is that temporal expressions are primarily construed in terms of one time, one-dimensional space. So, we have many forms of space, it could be, let's say, the surface, if you pour some water on top of the surface, the surface is going to go like kind of center periphery sort of motion. That is not the type of space we recruit for time in everyday cases. It tends to be one dimensional. So that's something that we sort of, apparently, we all do and we will see then if it's really universal. Now, the question is, if it's recruiting space and spatial construals, we want to know more details about what type of space and what type of spatial construals are recruited for supporting um, the abstract notion of, of time. So we're going to unpack a little bit types of space. One thing that's been studied quite a bit in um, linguistic anthropology and in experimental psychology as well is uh, spatial frames of reference and, and the summary, so to speak, uh, is that there's at least, there's more, but there's at least these three forms uh, in which observers characterize uh, relative positions of spatial objects. So, in the case of the pig is in front of the cow, the observer, um, it's called the object center frame of reference because it depends on where the observer is that uh, would result in characterizing or construing the pig as being in front of the cow. There's another one which is called ego center in which uh, the observer would say something like the pig is right of the cow. Again, in this case, depending on where the observer is, the, the form would, would change dramatically. Here, the, the references along uh, the construction of these two objects, here the, the reference really relies on the position of the observer. And then we have another form, which is called geocentric. Some people call it absolute. Uh, and this example would be a uh, cardinal absolute, in the sense that the observer may say something like, the pig is east of the cow. Now, the truth is that we tend to use all of them for different purposes. So if you're giving directions to how to get from San Diego to LA, you may focus on this one. Uh, if you want to say to someone, oh, pass me that bottle of water, you may say something like the bottle right to the salt, or maybe the bottle that's in front of so and so and so on. So we may tabletop, like on, on the small scale, we may use this, bigger scales, we may use that, and so on. But there are some groups around the world that tend to, and this is an interesting finding by I mean, lots of people, uh, uh, scholars working in Australia, and, and, and in Nepal and India, um, in Bali and so on, people who tend to prefer this form for everything. So they would say things like, oh, pass me the northern bottle of water, you know, things like that. <laughs> okay? So these are the kinds of things that now we want to explore. If people start to wait, work <coughs> in a different way with these space, spatial frames of reference, it, is that going to be the type of space that potentially could be recruited for temporal um, for grounding temporal relations. Now, that's about space. Let me make yet another distinction re regarding time. Um, this goes back to the work of philosopher MacTaggart, so this is now uh, almost a century ago. Uh, the distinction really between deitic time and sequence time. And deitic time refers to the type of time that has a center or a deitic center technique speaking, essentially, a time that has a now. And once you have a now, you have a future and a past. If you don't have a now, you do not have future and you don't, do not have past. So really, these, uh, the future and past are fundamentally didactic categories 
uh, resulting from the center now. So you, you, you know, you would say she left two days ago. That would be relative to a now. The week ahead looks good. This term ahead operates on um, on spatial terms, but also assumes that there is a now. So you can only, let's say, if you want to refer to the first week of November as the week ahead, I can only use this term at this very moment. But in mid-November, if I want to refer to the beginning of November, I cannot use the word ahead anymore. So sequence time doesn't have a now. In that sense, it's formally and logically simpler. Um, some people call, call it tenseless time. And the relationships that you really normally use are like the earlier than and later than relationships. So you say things like, you know, uh, spring follows winter, that's true no matter when, no need for a now, Tuesdays before Thursday, things like that. Or any, actually any storytelling. If you tell the story of the Second World War, you say, okay, at the beginning this happened, then this happened. Oh, I forgot to say that right before that this happened, and then before that happened, and so on. It's like independently of the noun in that case. This is going to be important uh, for many reasons, but uh, today, what I want to focus is on didactic time. Here's an example, by the way, uh, of uh, linguist a linguistic expression that could be understood in didactic sense or in a sequence sense. If they move the meeting forward, um, it could be considered here um, in a didactic sense or a sequence sense with consequences. For example, if you say, Let's say, uh, you say something like um, the Wednesday meeting. Let's, we can't do it on Wednesday. Let's move the Wednesday meeting forward two days. When is the meeting? How many votes for Friday? How many votes for Friday? <laughs> How many votes for Monday? Okay, there we go. So some people, they say, well, there are all these people English speakers. They say, well, I assume, more or less. And you have radically different inferences out of that. Well, the answer, the short answer is that, well, for some people, they interpret the forward in didactic sense. So two days ahead in the didactic sense, in front of us, like Jake Leno pointing in front. And some people interpret it in front of the sequence, like the pig in front of the cow. And those are earlier, therefore, Monday. So that's the, the one-liner. Anyway, so there are linguistic expressions that could construe, like in this case, uh, one type of time or the other, and very important to, to keep them uh, separate for all this study. So we're going to be focused on didactic time um, in this particular presentation. So how is didactic time construed then spatially? Well, after studying many, uh, many cultures and gathering all the information from many, many studies around the world, you get essentially one pattern that is really widespread, which is this ego center pattern that is preserving transitivity, meaning um, the present is the didactic center, temporally, so spatially is co-located with the ego. So this is now Jay Leno pointing today to where he is sat standing or sitting in that case. And if the speaker is walking, we'll say, well, let's do it right now. And then we're walking, we're like, well, I don't know, today, so no, the moment we're pointing here, and then it was pointing here. So it's really about co-location. Um, then future is in front of ego and past is behind ego. This is essentially the short, the, the, the Mickey Mouse version of it. What you have is a speaker in a space, and you have, at least in English and other languages, also some variations. You may have the temporal, uh, temporal entities in the landscape, so to speak, and then the observer moving. So you would get things like, uh, you know, um, we're approaching towards the end of the year. The end of the year is a location in space, and you move towards that location. Or you may say something like, Halloween is coming. So then you're standing, and then the, the temporal event is moving towards you. The common thing is that future is in front of the observer, passes behind the observer. The didactic center is co-located with, uh, with the observer. And you get this also in sign language and another, in ASL, for example. Um, is attested with linguistic analysis and also all types of psychological experiments you can do in the lab or uh, gesture analysis in the sense of the example I gave you with the J. Lennon. Now, the question of course is, well this is tremendously wide, really widespread all over the place, but is it universal? And this is where I want to begin now 
for the remaining of the talk is to sort of see what happens with this apparently universal but um, orientation for dietic time. So let's go first with the Aymara. Uh, I, will, I will summarize briefly for those who were not here a few years ago, but I'll just briefly summarize the findings we, we presented in that case. So if you just start with linguistic expressions, here is a um, construction, for example, for a past expression, an expression involving the past. It's an ancha naira pachana. If you do the morphine by morphine gloss, you get something like ancha is a lot, naira is the morphine we really care about here because it denotes eye or sight or front. Pacha, roughly speaking, is time, is more complicated than that, but let's leave it there for the moment. And na is a suffix that works very much like in English when you say, um, on Monday in September or at nine o'clock, something like that. So fixating time in, in, in some particular uh, dimension. Literal translation of that morphine gloss would be something like a lot I front time at. When is it used? What does it really mean when they say it? something like at a long time ago? Okay. So here we have. Something said, wait a second, long time ago, and you essentially recruit a morphine saying something like eye or sight or front. So, hypothesis, when you start gathering a lot of this data, you say, well, is it something about pass and front of the speaker, eye or sight or front, that is now um, anchoring this form of understanding? How about future expression? Here's a one, Agat Kribaru. A katribaru, do the morphine gloss, you get something like that. It's here or this. Ta and ru, they work very much like English from and to, towards. So you can say uh, from San Diego to LA, you would say San Diego ta, LA ru, something like that. Kipa is a morphine that is relevant here, denotes back or behind, the anatomical back. Literal translation here, this from back to or towards. <coughs> when is it used? from now on. So this is what a mom would say, okay, from now on you will eat all the food I prepare for you, meaning all the events for cooking in the future uh, are covered by that expression. So that's the kind of thing that would now recruit the kripa, the behind of the back morphine. Now, this was very exciting when the first time we encountered that, but um, of course there is a question, which is, is this a truly egocentric country universal. So this is now the point we need to know, we make sure that the front and the back are operating on an ego, not just on something else. Why is that relevant? Because let's say you take uh, the word before in English. Before, for has that morphine like for or front, and before we say the day before yesterday, that day happens in the past relative to yesterday and recruits the term for or front. Same thing with after, the day after tomorrow recruits the aft, an aft, like an aft of the ship or an aircraft, the rear part off to denote future, relative future in that sense. So the question, and this is now what happens also with the example with the, the Wednesday meeting, if you're thinking sequentially, and you, in that sequence you have a front and a back, it could be that the front and back, like in English before and after, is recruiting front and aft relative to a sequence, but not relative to an ego, okay? So, what we need to find out is like what we would do in English, that the week ahead looks good, well if you really look for the, all the linguistic material, it's gonna be the week ahead of us. You would find markers saying, the reference point of a head in those cases is us, some community, some human, and so on. As opposed to, uh, it is 20 minutes ahead of 1 p.m., in which the reference point is another temporal marker. Okay? So what we need to know is, what is a reference point? If the reference point is really ego, then we're in business. Then this Aymara case is truly a counter example for this widespread pattern thought to be universal at some moment. But if it's not, if it's just like English before and after, then it's no big deal. It's just like English before and after, or avant in French, or uh, antes in Spanish, and so on. So the linguistic test, linguists would say, 
just check for the reference point. The problem is that in Aymara, you check for the reference points, and for other reasons I'm not going to go into in, in, in Aymara grammar, you cannot find it. So all you find is front and back, but you can't tell just through the linguistic material what is the reference point for those expressions. So we, it's not conclusive. Just looking at the linguistic material, you have to look at something else. Etymology, of course, is not a big, may, may inspire or bring some hypothesis, but it's not the last word either because you know it doesn't tell you much about the cognitive reality of the speaker. So it could be that the term meant something 500 years ago. That's where it came from, but today it just, just doesn't have a, any role in the uh, actual, let's say, motor production of the speaker, like in gesture, for example. So, how can we tell? Well, this is when we um, we said, well, we have some challenges here because we don't have only the language uh, as a source. We can't just study that. It's not transparent in that sense. Um, then we need to also study the community with uh, bringing issues of ecological validity. We want to boost the ecological validity, avoid, let's say, you know, tests that we bring from the West and, and things like that. We want something that it would maximize ecological validity, uh, external validity, and internal validity. Um, so that's why we don't want to have, let's say, you know, overt judgments of people saying, okay, where is the future for you? Tell me, you know, what? Because then we're trying to, essentially asking for them to come, with a, come up with a story. So this is when we said, let's study gesture production in the same way you know, I illustrated with this example. What happens with, when we analyze the details of course speech gesture production? Then we can make explicit hypotheses about future and past and see where are they pointing. And if they're pointing more along the lines of, let's say, an object, and then this is the front and the back of the object, and this is where the morphemes are operating, like Kipa and Naira, that's one story. If the pointing go this way, really relative to the body of the speaker, then we're in the business of anchoring the didactic center on the ego. So that's the, what we did. Um, so this is a study that in the, in the Highlands, as I was saying, and we did this particular study in the northernmost tip of uh, Chile, the border with Bolivia and Peru over here. Uh, we had about 20 hours of raw video, people talking about temporal expressions, and from 17 towns in northern Chile, all of them are between about 4,000 meters above sea level. So that's like 12,000 feet, more or less. It's pretty high. And um, centered on everyday temporal expressions, anecdotes, stories, and so on. Essentially, the method we used here was, was what is called gesture elicitation paradigm. So we wanted them to explain things. And uh, so we, we put things like uh, the temporal equivalent to something like an apple a day keeps a doctor away. What does that mean? You know, so then you would explain to someone, say, okay, what we mean, when, you know, that means so and so, blah, blah, blah. And what we want to see is that what happens with their hands when they're explaining that. So we did a bunch of those. Um, so we essentially were analyzing the pointing directionality co-occurring with these temporal terms. So what you can do is like, we did also, not just in Aymara, but also in Castellano Andino, which is a kind of Creole, a Spanish, Andean Spanish, so to speak, uh, where you also can also find the same patterns, by the way. So this example is more or less from that. So you take the gesture production, you, you take the, the stream, um, and then you can sort of pinpoint exactly when certain words have been said, and then you can see where their hands are. So in this case, the guy is saying something like, from last year until this year. And so when he's starting to say from last, he's pointing towards the front with the left hand, index out, and completes that with until this year, you have now the pointing down very much like uh, Jay Lennon. Okay, so co-location. So we did tons of these. I'm not going to, um, just going to give you like real gestures so you get a sense of how it works. Here's one. The top left is based on a, on a um, misunderstanding. So this guy is they're talking about atatilas, which is the term for ancestors, and he and he thinks so. He's a speaker. He thinks that he's talking about the time of the Incas before the arrival of the Spaniards in that sense of ancestors, and he's talk, just talking about the great grandparents. So so he's going to clarify that to him. 
de los uh, HH, 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 sentir que imposible. Sí. Es de talla muy alta. No. So, when you say achachi achachila is a term uh, for ancestors, this the person here in the right said, oh, you mean the the Inca time? I said, no, 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 that's way before. You have a, a bimanual production. The index comes out pointing to the front, and so on. So he's talking about the old times. So at the moment it says the old times, the hands come comes out, the index it says old time. Now we were rotating these people, I didn't mention that, so in order to really dissociate, is the pointing if I'm pointing like this way, you don't know whether I'm pointing towards the door or in front of me. So you rotate the person and say, okay, now continue talking because, you know, and if I go like this, you have better, you know, better info saying, oh, this is about the body and it's not the door. If I go like that, then it's probably centered on other uh, items. And so the, these two are about the past. Here's an example of future on the right side now. Akamarat Mararu. Sorry. So Akamarat Mararu is, um, is, I have to do something quickly here, sorry. So the Akamarat Mararu is the um, is an expression that means from here until next year. So the speaker is going to um, is going to produce a gesture that goes like this, and then is going to show to the so from now until next year, a counter uh, lateral gesture, and then an ipsi lateral gesture with different hand morphologies. So just to summarize the whole thing, I'm just going to show you the the three quick things. Now this one is old time. And now this is the expression I was referring to. Akamarat Mararu. Akamarat Mararu. Si, Akamarat so here, this is what I was just telling you, you get akamarat from this year, so you have this pointing with the right hand, it's going to come there, collocation from this year until next. Ipsi, so this is a counterlateral with the right hand index out, second time, and now supported with an ipsi lateral with the thumb. So this is different, totally different hand morphology apparently pointing something behind him. And this is now about the future. So, um, summarizing many forms, many hand shapes. I'm not going to go into all the details, but uh, uh, we did the, you know, also checking Aymara people from the community who don't speak the language. And then you would get cases like this person saying something about the roots of his old history, you know, of his culture and so on, pointing towards the back, like what we, you, you and I would do, for example. Or here's another speaker talking about the future. This is a Aymara member of the community, um, but someone who doesn't speak the language, and these people would point to the front of the future like we would do. Um, these are just just some examples of, you know, how, well, is it just, just anecdotal? Well, no, you really observe in this area. Uh, essentially, the pattern, which is, for example, in this case, is just past front only. Uh, you will really see it in those who speak Aymara or the Creole, and those who only speak Spanish uh, or some bilinguals, um, you see much more the pattern that we do in the West, so to speak, or let's say in English or in Europe and so on. Now the sad thing is this slide is that um, the pattern is only observed or primarily observed uh, among people who are 65 or older. So it means that at this region in northern Chile, I'm not claiming this is what's happening in Bolivia or Peru, this is a pattern that's disappearing. This study is now already like nine years old or something. So these people are now 75. Many are probably now dead, unfortunately. <coughs> And the truth is that this is going to be um, out of the picture in maybe 10 years. Meaning that um, all these efforts of trying to save languages are focused essentially on trying to serve, save phonemes and, and the acoustics and the, 
uh, and sometimes the grammar, but uh, the forms of thinking that go with languages like this one, for example, uh, may disappear, even though the language is not challenging in, in any way. There's more than two million speakers of the matter today. All right, um, so the Amara case then is, could be striking in the sense that, you know, all of a sudden you have a culture that conceived egocentrically past as being in front and, and um, future behind, but in a certain way it's still egocentric. egocentric. So the question we had at some point uh, was, what well, could it be that there is a culture that would ground deitic time, not in egocentric, uh, forms, but on something like absolute or geocentric patterns, very much like what I showed here with the cow and the pig based on north and south or something like that. And uh, it was actually Jörg Bassmann, a, an anthropologist from Heidelberg, who contacted me after reading the Aymara work, and he said, well, this is very cool, but you know, I've been working for many years with this group that you know in Papua New Guinea, and I have a sense that they have a completely different um, notion of time that you have not described in your previous work. So, may I may be wrong, I don't know, but would you like to come with me? So, guess what I said? I said, well, of course. So, we organized a trip and uh, we did uh, this study I'm about to uh, present. So, the question then is, what are they really the properties of the const construal if you have now a culture that would spontaneously and primarily um, ground temporal relationship deitic time in something like uh, uh, geocentric coordinates. So this is now where we go to New Guinea. We're going to be this part of the world. And the Yugno live up in the Finisterre range. So uh, from Madang is uh, south east of Madang. And we're going to go up to about 2,000 meters above sea level. <coughs> and um, we're going to focus in the area where they live, which is in the upper Yugno Valley. So is where the Yugno River um, has the, uh, where, where the Yugno River begins. And there, essentially, is a very enclosed uh, geographic uh, setting that has no communication whatsoever with the rest, essentially. There's no road, no electricity. And the only way you can get there is walking from, from the uh, several day walk from the coast. So it looks essentially sort of like this. Um, the mouth of the river, it would go down that way. So this is the only access to this entire uh, open upper valley here. So this is where all these, these little towns um, are uh, located. The community has about 5,000 speakers. And each of these villages that you see there, this is Gua, uh, has about 400, 200, depending on the, on the Times. All right. So now, why this? As I was saying, Jürg Bassmann was the person who contacted me and said, well, in the cosmology and many aspects of everyday life in, among the Yugno, terrain declivity uh, seems to be really important. So topographic relations for all kinds of things, for characterizing uh, cosmology, uh, making sense of rain, and making sense of uh, uh, all types of things of everyday life, uh, have somehow um, Influence with our influence by topographic distinctions. And then this shows also in language in a big, big time. So you have topographic contrast appearing in spatial adverbs, in verbs of motion, and didactic systems. So you don't have things like, uh, for example, demonstratives like that, or those, or this, which are totally uh, neutral relative to properties like terrain declivity. And you know. Apparently, you need to have something like you have to say that, but that rolling down or that hanging in some ways, and so on. So you have to make distinctions that deal with uh, uh, topographic constraints and markers. Now, there's only one term that we could find that would sort of give us a hint that maybe there was something like this, which is the term of Morocco, um, which means down there on the other side, literally but used metaphorically, so to speak, as a, um, something like a few years ago. So something that has to do now with terrain topography used now for something like past. The question is, of course, is this anecdotal? Is this, is this the only expression that happens to be like that for some reason we ignore? Or is it something like it's a really solid pattern that it's, it's important to study? So this is, how, this is the background of the whole 
the whole project. So we started with preliminary interviews, uh, sort of getting a sense of, like a census of what are the most frequent and uh, used terms, temporal expressions, that would show up all the time when discussing issues of everyday life. And then we came up with about 15 expressions that covered dating time, past, present, present, and future, all three categories, on different scales. So days and weeks and months, lifetimes, and so on. So then what we did now was to improve the methodology we did with the Aymara, refine, refine it in many ways that I will try to characterize right now. Um, one of them was now that we recorded each of these expressions with a local dialect, uh, with a local accent. So it came something like this. Kalitsi Ingan. So Kalitsi Ingan, meaning long time ago, and now this is a, the true voice with us, so it's not just us or some of the people in the group coming up with the, with the terms, but they will actually listen to the, the, uh, the, the local people saying these terms. So the, the, the paradigm was essentially the same at some point. What does it mean when, you know, uh, we would compare some of these expressions and people would have to uh, disentangle some questions and so on. So we have what we call semi-structure interviews with sometimes pairs of adults, sometimes um, uh, individuals, depending, uh, sometimes inside, sometimes outside the house, so we'll see later why is that important. And then we also change the, the um, direction of the participants, where were they sitting, because we wanted to disentangle the ego from the topographic. So people were pointing in all directions, um, or being seated in different directions during the interview. And in this part, what I'm going to talk about today, we had uh, 27 participants, more men than women. Uh, you would say, why is that? And the short answer is because women were busy working and men weren't. So, <laughs> uh, men were available. They had machetes and everything. Like, Here we are. We're hunters, but we're ready to work with you. And women actually had to take care of the babies and the, the fire and uh, the land and every, absolutely everything. So it was very hard to get women who, have, who would have some time for us. Uh, we have to do some of the interviews actually out there in the field. Um, that's another topic, but very interesting. Lo lots of asymmetries uh, in, that, in that regard. Okay, we recorded all kinds of orientations, houses, uh, camera positions, everything, because what we wanted was to minimize in the field the, uh, all the measurements to, that would distract or chase away people so we recorded everything, and the idea was to reconstruct in the lab everything, you know, from scratch. So that's what we did. And this is now the method we came up with. So first, we, uh, out of the tons of hours from all these people, we annotated all the manual gesture. There's also head gestures, <laughs> knee gestures, elbow gestures, toe gestures, and so on. But here's only the manual gestures I'm presenting today. And uh, so for every production that would come up with a co-production with a temporal term, one of these 15 I mentioned, we would see what happens when at what time and so on. And we came up with about 845 manual temporal gestures. Now, many of those, of course, don't have a very precise hand shape. So some of them is like, oh yeah, it was long ago, or something like that. But well, you don't know what was that. Was it? The pointing, was it this coming out, or maybe it's the finger, the index. So the hand morphology sometimes is not clear, or maybe the directionality is not clear. So even though the hand morphology is, it is and so on, we said, okay, well, out of this 845, let's get la crème de la crème of these old gestures that would actually tell us something about the hypothesis. So we coded for, with blind, um, with blind coders, not aware of the hypothesis of anything about the human geography or anything. Directionality, what we call strokiness, which is this feature of gesture production that speaks about the acceleration and deacceleration of the gesture. So a good stroke would be something like this, as opposed to something like that. Okay. So stroke would be acceleration and then abrupt deacceleration, and then also displacement. Displacement, is it like little like this, or is it like a big displacement from the body? So we selected uh, the best 215 gestures um, that we retained with the clearest morphological profile, 
without knowing whether these were about future or past or anything, we just what are the best 215, and also capping some of the participants because some were you know more producers of gestures than others, so we didn't want the the database to be like biased by the one big speaker gesture guy. Okay. Good. Then we had two more coders, um, blind coders, recoding now from the. Uh, from the videos now back in San Diego, um, especially I'm going to just talk about the top view. They were now reconstructing the directionality of the pointing. So if the person would see some point like that, they would have to, with this bar, reconstitute where the pointing was relative now from the top camera um, or the top view. Where would that that uh, pointing come from? And then we also did it with front and the side, but I'm not talking about that data today. So. With these three views, we have this uh, reconstruction now uh, from from the um, using using uh, coders, and in step four, because we have the measurements of the angle for each camera, now we uh, we ask the uh, coders to locate the um, the shoulder line relative to the camera. So we had some other people saying, okay, if the camera was let's say like this very camera in this room, then the person looking at the camera would have to reconstitute my position of shoulders and nose here relative to that angle. So then they can just sort of put it like move it around to reconstitute. So with all those four, now we have various layers. And the final layer, which is the most relevant one, is to put all on top of the topographic information of the Yugno Valley. Where are all these gestures pointing? When is future, when is past, and so on? when we put them on top of the topography of the terrain. So, results. The first thing we wanted to know is, is there a dietic center? And then, if there is a dietic center, what happens with past and future? Okay? So, the first thing we found that, yes, indeed, there is a dietic center. And like anything else we've seen so far, the dietic center is co-production with a, a pointing towards a co-location with the speaker. I can give all the statistics later if you, someone is interested, but so when people were pointing toward the ground, which essentially is something you cannot see from the top of the angle, um, then it co-occurred with temporal um, expressions that had to do with now, today, this day, something like that. Now, here is the second problem. Second problem is that we're going to now analyze directional statistics. And uh, I don't know how many of you do statistics in your work, but most of statistics uh, coming from the 19th century on is all based on what's called linear statistics, even when it's very sophisticated, multivariate, and so on. Essentially, all the variables we use, cholesterol levels, uh, reaction time, uh, income, whatever, they go from little to more. <laughs> The problem here is when you have directional data, it's very hard to pick a zero. Because um, when you go from little to more, low cholesterol to high cholesterol, you know, let's say, where the zero is and so on. But in the case, in the case of uh, directional data, you, get, you encounter a new problem, which is depending on where your zero is going to be, those who lie on one or the other side of the zero if you calculate an average, it's going to give you a completely wrong direction. So let's say this is our zero, and I measure, let's say, 5 degrees or 355 degrees. If I calculate the mean between 5 and 355, you get 180, which is wrong. Okay? So when you get a bunch of directions, then it's a mess. So with that, we say, OK, how do we do this problem? And you look at some parts of the literature, like people who do uh, movements of birds and you know, fish in the ocean, or the average direction of the breeze in LA today, or the wind, moving all like that, what is the average? When it moves on one side, like here, no problem. That's a good, but when it moves all over 360 degrees, is a problem. So we needed to get into spherical statistics to analyze this data, because they were all pointing on a topographic valley. Another problem we face is that I don't know how many of you are aware of this, but spherical statistics are very recent. Just to give an example, the correlation coefficient in the simple R, Pearson's R, goes back to the 19th century, Carl Pearson. 
the correlation for two directional variables is from 1982. Okay? So you don't have the non fancy regressions and the fancy things because they are being developed as we speak and they're very, you know, very simple. So we had that kind of problem, but um, luckily we could use what we used for the kinds of questions we had. But it's something to keep in mind when you work with uh, spherical or directional stats. Anyway, so here we put the, the result now. We, what's, what happens is that when we go to the Yukon Valley, here's the river. Here, the mouth is heading that way. The source of the Yukon is up here. This is the village, and this is now uh, amplified and zoomed out over here. I'm zoomed in, sorry. So, roughly speaking, I could give you all the stats and the spherical statistics, stats which are very sexy, but anyway, that's another talk. Um, the one liner, the past. The past production, so, and this means gestures that were produced while saying something about the past, no matter what bodily orientation the speaker had, tended to go this way, and this is the cone, uh, going essentially down the hill. These are the topography marking in there. And in the future, it was heading this way. We don't know, we can't interpret yet, what is this kind of against the ridge over here, or maybe <coughs> pointing towards the source of the river, we don't know that yet. We're going to go next year and find out. We've got new funding, so we're happy about that. We'll see. The point is, summarizing, is that you get this nice dissociation between gestures produced for past and future, uh, knowing now that the gestures produced for, center, uh, for present is co-located. Many other interesting things come out. Um, so, when you look at the, this is like all the outdoor data. I'm going to say a word about the indoor data in a minute. So, when speakers were outside of their houses, which is the only built thing you see in this area, this is the pattern you see. And one interesting observation, other than just being topographic center, not ego center, is that it's not a line anymore. So. The usual idea that future goes one way and passes the other way, here it, doesn't, it just breaks down. So you can do all the stats again, and essentially you have a broken line. And we did extra statistics to figure out that not only from the top view is broken, like this, but it's also from the front view is broken. So gestures towards the, the past, they tend to be more around this angle. And gestures for the future, they much more, uh, the slope is much bigger. So even in, from the front, it's broken. So essentially, in the 3D, it's kind of broken, like kind of like this. So the, the time line then is not is not the timeline that we assume um, in other places to be. Now another shocking result for us, at least, was that when we did the interviews indoors, a completely different pattern emerged. So this is a group of people, like many others described. Um, before in Australia, as I was saying, <coughs> who are he who heavily rely on geocentric coordinates for characterizing space. So pass me that downhill orange, or pass me that uphill apple. You know, those would be kind of the pattern in a certain way. But all all the societies that have been described as relying heavily on absolute or geocentric uh, frames of references, they tend to keep it no matter where they are inside the house. People have tried to bring them some, some other place, rotating them, whatever, and they end up knowing exactly where the north is and so on. What happened here was very different. As soon as you enter these houses, which is essentially like a wooden igloo or sort of something like that, here you kind of see the scale, um, you enter like a dark universe. These things have no windows, uh, only a fireplace in the middle, Fire is on every time they're in there for illumination, for cooking, for warmth, for everything. And there's a lot of smoke <laughs> as a consequence. There's no windows. It's just smoke like crazy. Uh, the first two or three days, I had, had to literally drag myself on the ground because it was the, the least smoke I could find in this room. As, as soon as you were moving up, the, the amount of smoke was absolutely crazy. So the point here is that when when we were inside, we noticed, and this is now through ethnography first, that people were talking about this side of the house as downhill, and this side of the house as uphill, with lexical terms, 
um, irrespective of the rotation of the house and irrespective of the rotation of the house in the valley, whether it was downhill or uphill. So then we had the idea, say, well, maybe let's check that and do a little experiment of having people dis um, discriminating between similar optics and, and saying, okay, point to the uphill you know, apple, or drag, or grab the downhill bag, or something like that, different terms. And it was almost 90-something percent clear that inside, uh, inside these houses, as soon as you enter the house, downhill and uphill is relative to the house, and there's no more valley uh, anywhere. So then we said, well, this is different because it's different from what we've been reading about topographic uh, uh, construals of space. How about now time? And when we did that experiment with, when we did the observations of Jesuit using the same uh, spherical stats, we come up with a similar pattern. So future Jesuit would be pointing away from the entrance, and past would be pointing um, towards the entrance. So this is now collapsing all the houses that we were using, in this case, three different houses with different orientations. So um, for us, that was a, a very interesting um, observation because we, we hadn't seen anything like this in which you really, as you walk in, uh, you, you change completely the, the, the pattern of, uh, of the frames of reference. Now, let me just give you a quick view here. So this is, for example, a speaker talking about yesterday terms over here. Tomorrow is over there. And this is the rotation I was illustrating. So here the person is talking about yesterday by pointing downhill towards his back. After rotation, continues talking downhill towards the front. This is an indoor. The person sitting along the, the, the fire, pointing towards the, out the, the entrance with the right hand. Rotated, and now is the left hand. Uh, this is the case for tomorrow. Uh, this is what I was trying to illustrate, the idea that there's more slope for future turns. In this case, the top of the hill is in front of him, but when rotated, then it goes behind him. Uh, this is now what's happening inside the, the, the house. Same speaker now pointing towards away from the, from the entrance where the light is. And this is rotated now pointing again away. So really clearly dissociating the ego from these external uh, markers. Just to give you an example, here's some quick real world gestures. Daddy, Atma, Abjo. That's a sequence. Again, again. He's going to two days ago, yesterday. Now, to change your hand. Two days ago, yesterday, today, location. Rotated, and then talking later about the same thing. Yesterday and tomorrow. Yesterday's outdoors. And then finally, even though everything I said in this talk was about manual gestures, I just want to illustrate that the, this is now another topic, but the incredibly pervasive use of the head and nose in this culture for pointing. Usually, we point with nose and head when we have our hands busy, so we're carrying books, and where's the toilet? Oh, it's over there, go, you know, three doors and so on. Well, when the hands are free, normally we use our hands. But in this culture, we're really um, shocked to see the amount of nose pointing. Actually, we have a paper chuck in gesture only on nose pointing because it's, it's amazing. It's another topic. You need different muscles. The, the labial levator, you move it like crazy in order to, to have your nose come. I cannot reproduce that. You need a lifetime training to really point precisely with your nose and, and so on. It has lots of advantages because it frees other articulators for modi modifying that. You could say something precise or not precise, which you know which you can do at the same time with the nose. Anyway, this is a cool thing. This is an example of a temporal head gesture. So it goes like that, higher, higher, and then um, towards the top of mountain. Now, one last thing, we found also something interesting is the fact that in, especially when they were inside the houses, there would be lots of straight upward pointings, and uh, which are, you know, there's no mountain over there. So we were kind of wondering, 
some anthropologists at some point said something about God and things like that. We weren't sure. Uh, but the thing is that it's, it's very... So all the statistics I show here about pointing upwards inside the house are not considering these cases, which is straight forward up. And we saw a few of these outside of the houses, and we believe, we think this is a hypothesis, again, we're going to check that next year, is that it's probably when you change from village to village, the direction of the source of the river changes, and this becomes, so if you visit another village, probably you, you need something more common, and this could be like a signature of like, um, sort of a straight forward up, or or an, an unmistakable up or something like that that doesn't that doesn't change um, when you move around. So, but we observed really uh, this up, upward pointing gesture only, by the way, with future expressions, but pretty pervasive as well. Okay, let me uh, conclude now. So, universal. Um, there's a kind of universal trend here that humans construe time using space. And it tends to be a one-dimensional space, extended in different ways. It could be, it could be like this type of one linear space, or it could be a sagittal space in which I'm part of the space. It could be more complicated forms like cyclic or helix-like, uh, in which if you take a, the, the topological segment of a helix, let's say, or a circle, it has the same properties as the one on the line. So some of these spaces, the speaker is part of, and some. This, the, 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 the space is allocentric, but it's one dimensional nonetheless. And then another thing that seems to be universal is that the deitic center seems to be associated with ego's location. And now we observe it even in a group like Yugno, which has a dramatically different notion, but still the, co it's still the, the present, the deitic center is still co located. And the other thing, as we saw with some of the gestures going like uh, the day before yesterday, yesterday, now, and tomorrow preserving transitivity of distance from the speaker is also something that we observe in the Aymara and many other studies have shown with other groups. Um, so this is also something uh, that uh, the student of mine, Kinsey Cooper writer, with whom I was doing all this work along with your Bassman, was also trying to um, figure out in terms of gesture production um, how these properties are uh, produced, uh, sorry, could be documented relative to uh, in this particular culture. So uh, with uh, Kensi and Yurik, we were wondering, OK, what are now the factors motivating the Aymara and the Yugno pattern? The work with Aymara, I mostly did with Eve Switzer, a linguist at UC Berkeley. The work with the Yugno, with the Yul Bassman and Kensi Cooper writers. So we were wondering, well, what is motivating these patterns? Why these patterns? What is it that uh, bring them forth this way? So in the case of the Aymara, we believe that there is something like overemphasis on visual perception as a source of knowledge. Aymara has really a strong use of evidentials. Uh, and this also shows up in Castellano Andino, the Creole type I was describing. So in Aymara, you, everything you say, uh, where is the parking lot, have you seen Bob, and so on, everything you answer in to those questions, you would have to say whether you saw it with your own eyes or whether you heard that Bob was there or something like that or you read it in the book, uh, as opposed to seeing it with your own eyes. So for those, you have different markers, and they get also into the Creole, sometimes in a very funny way, because they recruit grammatical distinctions that work in Spanish, but they use those distinctions that are Spanish-based for the Aymara needs. So uh, sometimes turning out in completely crazy constructions that is very clear in the Castellano Andino, but they make absolutely no sense in, um, in, in Spanish, standard Spanish. All right, um, so what we think is something like, there's something like a metaphor, so to speak, like a knowing is seeing. What you see, what you know is what you actually see. So if you want to talk about uh, was last summer hot or cold, or was it wet or dry, that's something you saw. And in that sense, you would sort of evoke the properties of seeing uh, frontal visual field and, 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 and bodily orientation with respect to that. And what's outside of the visual field then, it would be uh, those things that you cannot talk about. I can't tell you right now what books are behind me. If I want to know that, then I have to turn and put that in my visual field. So that's what we think is going on. Of course, it's not the um, uh, sufficient uh, 
condition in the sense that there's many other cultures that have very strong use of evidentials as well, but not necessarily having this body orientation. So this is still uh, work, work in progress. The, the, the cultural use of the, of the marker is also interesting. Uh, in Aymara, you're not allowed to talk about your childhood using the marker for I saw it. Let's say, oh, I remember my first uh, pet. It was blah, blah, blah. If what you know is what your parents told you about that, then you should use the marker saying, I didn't see that. Also, when you had a good time in a party and you were drunk, you can't say the following day, oh my god, wasn't that a great party? <laughs> no, you have to use the, I was told it was a great party. <laughs> you know? and, and it truly is, is interpreted in the culture, like say, oh come on, you're telling me you were not drunk? If you use the marker saying, I was there and I saw it. No, I said, I was told it was great and I was told I drank a lot and, and so on. That, with that grammatical. So the practices really are embedded in all these forms. So what comes out in the Aymara pattern apparently is something like a landscape, uh, let's say, characterizing briefly here, you would have the observer only that now everything is outside of the visual field uh, preserve the properties uh, of the, of, um, the non-seeing, non-known um, aspects and preserving the transitivity. Further away behind is further away in the future and the opposite for past where things can be visible and observable. Now, we didn't observe any motion in these cases, so that's why I didn't put any arrows. So there's no motion involved in this type of construal. Things are in front or behind, but we don't know anything from the data we have that anything is approaching anything. It's just, that's, it's, a, it's a static picture, at least based on the data we have. How about the Yugna? Well, we know that there's a, this sort of centrality of the topographic spatial system that has been already documented before. How pervasive is um, the characterization of, of uh, spatial relationships using topographic markers? So this is not now cardinal absolute forms like north and south, it's all slopes and terrain declivity. And so it seems also that now documented by Jürg Bachmann, this sort of an association between the macro scale downhill with ancestral past. So in their cosmology, they talk about the origin of their group coming from, you know, the ancestors coming from the shores and walking all their way up and the motion is in into the valley. And this is now, if we want to make sense of the data we observe inside the houses and the data we observe outside, so the outdoor and the indoor data with a single encompassing explanation to uh, preserve um, parsimony, we think what's going on is something like an entrance schema going on. In the sense that indoor houses, because they're big slopes, the houses have to be built with an horizontal uh, footprint. Um, so the slope is like that, and the house is like this. And every time you enter, you have to go up with several steps, between two and five steps. We have an entire paper on steps on in to get, get into the house. The point is that you only enter houses going up. So we think that maybe the, 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 temporal, the temporal corresponding uh, inference is that if you profile the entering action, the process of entering, the earlier moments of the entering in the past relative to the moment when you're inside, they're down. And when you go in, you're, you're uh, in the temporal, the temporal sequence, uh, you're moving towards the inside. So we think that what's going on in the future is just by contrast, but this is the entrance schema that is probably, this is a hypothesis being profiled where you can derive now the temporal relationship between the now of being inside and the past as being outside, whether it's the ancestral past or the individual past relative to the house. Now what is novel among the Yugno is first the geocentric topographic, which is something has not been uh, documented ever, and so this is very new. And this was actually a shocker for us. We, when we were doing the work with the Aymara, we assumed that all this gesture and all these things were kind of a consequence of the use of language and linguistic expression that have this metaphorical content. Get your metaphor straight, look for gestures just to have motor behavioral evidence of it. Well, here we found there were no, there was no metaphorical expressions for time, based, and space. 
all the temporal expressions except the one I gave at the beginning, homoromo, they're all just temporal expressions, like tomorrow, like after, and so on. We don't use tomorrow in spatial sense, for example, in English. So all of these were temporal. There was no metaphorical language. So the only thing that gave us a hint was gesture production. And now this says something else, is that there's many papers out there that when they go to and look for linguistic structure in particular cultures, oh, this culture doesn't have a spatial notion of time or something like that, when you just look to see, are there any metaphors, temporal metaphors for space? Oh, we check, we check, we check, we didn't find any. Conclusion, no. Well, we would have reached the same conclusion here had we done that. It's only when you analyze the gesture production that you get a hint. So you could have conceptualization that is statistically incredibly significant, robust, uh, um, with patterns very specified, but only visible through bodily motion in this case, and not through linguistic uh, markers or terms like lexical, lexical uh, items. The other thing is the asymmetry of the broken line. So in that sense, the timeline that we take, we tend to have even for the Aymara case, front and back. In this case, now there's no real line. It's essentially slope-driven, and depending on the terrain declivity, the slope could go in any direction. And the other thing which was novel is the adaptation of the pattern when going inside. So all of a sudden, as soon as you're inside these houses, all the, uh, the, 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 the uh, relationship between the topographic mapping are now recruited and mapped into the internal structure. So to close, I want to go back to the quote if men did not have the same conception of time, space, cause, number, etc., all contact between their minds would be impossible, and with that, all that together. Well, in a certain way, he was right at certain, in a certain level. When you think about, let's say, the deitic centers, well, they all tend to be collocation. They're all spatial, and they're collocation with the speaker. So in that sense, there is something fundamental that seems to be shared up to the data we have right now. Uh, but of course, there's like a huge variation of whether you anchor time topographically, whether it's a line or is not, whether it goes uphill or in front or behind. These are all like really radically different construals. Not only that, the grounding and probably the whole motivation for bringing forth that particular construal have uh, tremendous variability. So we can't just say uh, it, that that is shared in a fundamental way. So I want to go back to kind of the idea of biological evolution here. If we really want to understand life and how the different forms of life evolve, we cannot get rid of the outliers. It's actually variability that would tell us an incredible story in biological evolution. But for some reason, uh, maybe influenced by experimental psychology or other techniques in which averaging is the way of going and so on, then these cases that would occur in very isolated places then they tend to be um, dismissed. And sometimes, of course, with the issues in, in methods, of course, you can't do brain scans in the way you would like to do, let's say, with these people, because uh, you will get completely, even if you bring human you know, people to a scanner, you won't get the signals because the noise will be tremendous. It will be something like, you know, let me out, I want to go peeing somewhere, you know? So that's going to be the signal you're going to see, and the, the future and the past going to be just very weak relative to these other big signals. So, the point is, we should really take these forms, I would say, not as like a, like anecdotal variation, but really as, a, as essential forms of variation that we need to understand seriously in order to have a better story of who are we as humans and how do we come up, how is it that we come up with abstract notions. And for that, we need to take all these variations uh, very seriously. And with that, uh, I want to thank all the collaborators in uh, northern Chile, uh, for the Aymara project, all the collaborators in the you know, uh, Valley, and uh, other people in my lab, and thank you. Unfortunately, we find ourselves subject to the tyranny of time. There's time for just one question. Short question. Well, well this is short. I, I didn't take the only question. Okay, it's a point of clarification. Um, okay, they have the larger valley. But in, in a larger valley, you can find that here on campus, where we have the Santa Monica Mountains. You could also get in a place like in front of the bookstore, where the nearest uphill would in fact be in a different direction. Right. So which way are they pointing? And, and if in fact they're using the larger mountain as a primary frame, 
is in the sense that they switch the maps if they right. go indoors. So you're okay. talking about space. Not time, right? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. So that's right. We, we I didn't go, go into all the details of how you, you can transpose dietic centers, you can you know, move around, or you can say, you know, uh, if you're facing this way in that building, even though you're facing a different one, and you may be gesturing in that, in that sense. So here, what we, we didn't actually, our study wasn't based on space proper. We assumed that these distinctions went away. We, we, uh, we checked with the, like the standard uh, you know, tabletop kind of objects to be sure that this, this was the case. And then we were focused on temporal relations. So we just looked at, you know, is there an indicting center? And where are they pointing when they're talking about past and future? So in that sense, it was simplistic. Now, the other thing we did with space was to say, well, as soon as you move into the space, the, the indoor houses, then something happens with this, these distinctions, downhill, uphill, which become now a different level. And then we wanted to see, is that robust and stable? And yes, it was. And then the next question was, well, is that recruited for time? And it was. But you're right. Another much, you know, much more in-depth, if we want to understand all the nuances of temporal uh, positioning and pointing in, sorry, the spatial pointing and positioning, then yeah, we would need to dig in and look for those cases. Right. Thanks. Yeah. Thank you. All right. Thank you.